The Sacramento Kings season is on the edge of disaster. Call it dramatic if you want, but a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about the Kings fighting for a fifth or sixth seed. Now, there's a very, very legitimate chance that the Kings could finish 10th. Sacramento has now entered a three-way tie with the Lakers and Warriors for 8th, 9th, and 10th place. They lose five games to the Pelicans in one season. And you are listening to Locked on Kings. You are Locked on Kings, your daily Sacramento Kings podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it is that time. Time for another episode of Locked on Kings. Hello and welcome into Locked on Kings, your podcast hub for Sacramento Kings coverage all season long. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed. That's $150. Win or lose, visit FanDuel.com slash locked on. To learn more, my name is Matt George. I have the privilege of being your host here. I'm a Sacramento sports anchor and reporter for ABC 10 News. Now, I'll be completely honest with you. I did not have the highest of expectations for the Sacramento Kings coming into tonight's game against the New Orleans Pelicans. In fact, I tweeted out just before tip-off that I was hoping for a make-me-believe-again type performance from Sacramento. Those of you who have listened to Locked on Kings over the last handful of episodes know that my vibes with this Sacramento Kings team are not very good. Now, oddly enough, in many ways, there were there were aspects of this Kings game that addressed and didn't necessarily fix, but, but improved upon some of my biggest concerns with the team coming into tonight's game. A lot of that on the offensive side of the floor, which we'll get into. There are some positives to take from this game. But ultimately, this is a results-driven league. And the Kings had a chance at home to win another big game, and they fell to the New Orleans Pelicans 135-123. to Now, I always felt like out of the two games, out of the back-to-back with the Pelicans and the Suns, if there was a game to lose, this was the more ideal one. But of course, there's no guarantee that the Kings beat the Suns tomorrow. Now they've put themselves in a position where, I mean, if this game tonight wasn't must win, which if it wasn't, it was pretty darn close. Every game from here on out, these final two games against the Pelicans and the Blazers are absolute 100% must win. Not just because of the tiebreaker implications with the Phoenix Suns, not just because you're still fighting for a chance to leapfrog the Suns and snatch seven away from them, because at this point, You have no more wiggle room, right? You had a slight lead for a while over the Lakers and the Warriors, even a point where cocky Matt George over here, I was thinking, you know what, they're not even a concern. Just focus on trying to beat the Pelicans, trying to beat the Suns, uh, trying to beat the Dallas Mavericks. See if you can find a way up to five or six, right? That's how we were feeling three weeks ago. That's why I'm saying this season is on the edge of absolute disaster because I've explained to you before, and I'll, I'll summarize it again, the Kings falling to ninth or 10th is terrible compared to finishing 7th or 8th. Of course, ideally, you'd like to get to 6th and just have a guaranteed play in, uh, playoff spot and guaranteed to make it to the se- uh, a playoff series, but that's out of the question, Ralph, right? The Kings are guaranteed to be a play-in team. Playoffs are, are no longer on the table. And really, honestly, coming into tonight, I felt like that was the case anyway. I told you, my mindset changed for the remainder of the season after their uh, loss and their blown lead against the Oklahoma City Thunder, my mindset changed to, hey, just hold on to eighth. Now, not only are you at risk of falling to ninth, you could potentially end up in the worst possible spot, which is 10th. Now, to me, honestly, there's not a huge difference between nine or 10. Both are terrible because in ninth or 10th place, you have to win twice to get the eighth seed. And if you lose once, you're done versus seven or eight. You win once in the seven or eight game, then you get the seventh seed. If you lose that game, then you take on the winner of nine or ten. So you get cra- two cracks at it, right? So the massive advantage of seven or eight versus nine or ten, I mean, it, it speaks for itself. But here the Kings are in a position where they could easily fall to nine or even ten if they don't handle their business for the remainder of the season. Every single team except for the Sacramento Kings that's in the play-in picture is, is pra- playing good basketball right now. They're feeling pretty hot. The Kings are the one that's they're the they're the ones that are floundering right now. And 
I mean, it might be a betting favorite for Sacramento to fall into 9 or 10 at this point, especially with the Phoenix Suns coming in tomorrow. A three-way tie with the Warriors and, and Lakers. It's a position that I did not at all expect the Kings to be into or to, to fall into, truly. But that's the position that they put them in. De'Aaron Fox actually said post-game, like, we put ourselves in this position. This is where we're at. We got to face it. So it is a disaster, or at least it's the edge of disaster. Again, you can call it dramatic if you want, and and, and yes, it's like a, the opposite of the, the Lady Gaga song, Edge of Glory, like Edge of Disaster. You can call it dramatic if you want to, but genuinely, in my opinion, and I think in the opinion, opinion of, of people in this organization, the Kings falling from 8 to 9 or even 10 is absolutely a disaster considering where they were earlier on in the season. Granted, of course, the Malik Monk injury and the Kevin Herter injury certainly play a factor into this, but talking about bad losses earlier on in the season, blown leads, struggles that this team has dealt with all year long, you put yourself in this position. You did not give yourself the the breathing room that you needed to be able to handle something like this, and now here you are. So we're going to talk, of course, in the, the last segment of the show about the Phoenix game coming up, the Blazers game after that, and and like it's kind of put up or shut up time. We're going to get to that in a second. But after the game, Mike Brown and De'Aaron Fox both talked about the position that they're in. Mike talked about the learning experience being in this position and the significance of these games. And De'Aaron Fox, after Mike, talked a little bit about the difference between 8 and 9 or 10 and how aware the team is of this circumstance. We all should be embracing this 100% for sure, guys. I want to freaking win every game. And trust me, uh, I go home and I bang my head against the wall just like everybody else in that locker room on these losses. Uh, but I'm, I'm excited about it. I want to, I'm, I've embraced it, it, it. If we could have finished in sixth, I wanted that more than anything else or fifth. But at the end of the day, uh, this is where we are, and let's freaking go get it, and let's learn and grow from it and see what happens at the end of the day. But I'm, I'm excited about any opportunity to play in the postseason. I mean, it's a, it's a huge difference, obviously, regardless of if you're at home or um, on the road. But, you know, you're 9-10, you – wake up that day and you just have a bad game, like you're done. Um, so at least when, when you're seven, eight, you technically have the opportunity to have a bad first game. Obviously you don't want to, you don't want to do that, but um, having two opportunities is much better than basically having one and then you have to win that game and then you have to win another game. So it's, it's much easier to, to, to go one and one than it is to go two and oh in, 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 in a time like this. On another note, it turns out the number 20 is an unlucky number for the Sacramento Kings. Over the course of a week, two polar opposite situations, but they're not specific just to this week, although we we got them in a a short timeline. You have, during the four-game road trip, two blown 20-point leads in losses, right, to the New York Knicks and the Oklahoma City Thunder to start the road trip and to end the road trip. Basically, both of those games happened the exact same way, right? You started out red hot shooting the basketball in the first half. Second half, you fell apart. You lose both of those games and blow two 20-point leads. Tonight, the Kings were down by 23 at two separate times before they woke up, got going, made a push, and battled back and made the game significantly more interesting. Now, the Kings never led at any point in this game. They didn't. The closest they got, other than 0-0, the closest that they got was two points, right? They were down 23 in the first quarter. From the end of the first quarter through a awesome second quarter, Sacramento, I mean, they they, they fought their asses off. The Kings uh, scored 35 points in the second quarter after a 23-point first quarter to, to make the score more respectable, at least, going into halftime. And I thought, honestly, it started with the brilliance of De'Aaron Fox, Right, De'Aaron clearly flipped a switch. I don't know if it was desperation. I don't know if Mike or somebody in the in, in, in the huddle or on the bench said, like, De'Aaron, we need you to carry us through this because the Kings got punched in the mouth immediately by the Pelicans to start this game. De'Aaron 
turned on the speed. He turned on the effort. He was giving 110% on both ends of the floor. Like, some of the hardest basketball that I think we've seen De'Aaron Fox play outside of the playoffs in his career. He was absolutely fighting as if the Kings season depended upon it, and this was the last game of the season, and if the Kings lost tonight, they weren't going to be in the playoffs, period. Right? That's how hard he was fighting, and it woke up the rest of the Kings to where they made a pushback. I also thought Harrison Barnes, in so many ways, was brilliant in this game. Harrison was clearly an attack the basket mode tonight. Hit a couple threes as well, but he did a great job getting downhill and scoring around the rim for Sacramento and helping them establish an offensive presence. So there was so much that was good from the Kings tonight, especially on offense, how they were able to battle back. But two different occasions where you go down by 20 points, the second one even more demoralizing because you had battled all the way back. The third quarter kind of has a rough ending to it. And then the fourth quarter... With Zion on the bench, the Pelicans, led by C.J. McCollum, kind of break your back and go back up by 23 points, and you think, okay, there's six minutes left. In my opinion, it was like, okay, maybe now you consider pulling the starters because you got the Phoenix Suns tomorrow in a must-win game. No, Mike keeps the starters out there, and they make a push and suddenly get it down to 13, and there's three minutes left, and the crowd's into it, and you still have a chance, and it's like, okay, why... Why why does it why are you waiting or till you're down 20 maybe waiting is not the right word cuz that's not fair that makes it sound like the kings weren't fighting why does it take you getting down by 20 to suddenly start to make that push and gain some ground and get some momentum and figure it out fight has never been the issue or never been the question with this kings team right one thing i don't have to question any night with sacramento is how hard they're going to work because they fight Maybe sometimes earlier earlier on in the season when they were playing teams that we know they're better than and they didn't fight hard enough, like the Detroit game that they lost here in Sacramento a couple months ago. Like at that time, maybe I could question it. But over this stretch where the Kings have struggled down uh, uh, with the final couple weeks of the season here in this play-in race, I've never once, once questioned this team's fight and resolve and effort. It's never been a problem. I know that they're going to give their all. The problem is... One, it doesn't feel like they're all is enough. And two, why is it taking a 20-point deficit for them to give their all? Or why are they not continuing to give their all when they are up by 20 and two separate occasions on the road, right? Just very opposite ends of the spectrum or extremes of losing, going down big, being up big, that the Kings have found themselves on, which speaks to the overall inconsistency of this team as a whole. And I'll, I'll say this too. The Kings played five games against the Pelicans this season. Lost all five. I think tonight was maybe the most competitive out of them. I honestly don't remember. But the Pelicans have owned Sacramento. Completely owned them. And it's at a point now where, selfishly, and I'll explain why, we should be rooting for the Pelicans to win every game for the remainder of this season. But also, you should be rooting for that because you don't want to face the Pelicans in the plan. You don't. You're not going to win that game. Phoenix, you at least have a little bit of a chance, although we'll see tomorrow how the Kings truly uh, match up without Malik Monk and without Kevin Herter. But playing a, 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 the Pelicans, playing a bad matchup five times is brutal. And this is, I think, an issue that we, we need to talk about and we're going to hear conversation about when it comes to the in-season tournament. I thought the in-season tournament was, was an absolute success, was a lot of fun in so many ways this year. It also feels like the in-season tournament was a decade ago at this point. But teams who are eliminated from the in-season tournament because we don't know who's going to be playing later on in the year and they have to adjust the schedule, or should I say, we don't know who's going to be playing in the later rounds of the tournament and they have to adjust the schedule, it's because of that that the Kings are playing the Suns five times and are playing the Pelicans five times. The Pelicans are a horrible matchup against the Sacramento Kings. The Phoenix Suns, I mean, we're talking two teams that are good playoff-level teams in the Western Conference. Meanwhile, there are other teams, and I don't know who directly, they got to play the Pistons five times, or the Hornets five times, or the Spurs five times. There's competitive advantages and disadvantages to that, and Sacramento, I think, found themselves on the disadvantage side in this first year. That's not the reason they're in this position, but I think that's a concern that needs to be talked about and needs to be addressed because the schedule is created for a reason. I understand 
if you're in a division with the Pistons, you're going to play them more than the Sacramento Kings are as an Eastern to Western uh, opponent. So there's already a mismatch or there's already a, a, an advantage there for some East Coast teams or Eastern Conference teams compared to Sacramento. But if you're playing a bad matchup five times in the same season and you're going 0-5 to them, yeah, I got a little bit of a problem with the playing tournament. I will say, though, offensively, there was so much from this game that was so much better. And I'm going to get into that. Plus, I talked to Mike Brown before the game started and got a chance to kind of challenge him a little bit on the over-reliance on three-pointers and the lack of paint scoring in Oklahoma City. And he gave me a really long and well-thought-out answer that I wanted to play for you here on the podcast. So that's all coming here uh, in just a second. Today's episode of the Locked On Kings podcast is brought to you by Nissan. Are you the kind of driver that likes to push things a little further? Ever wonder what adventure could be waiting for you around the next corner? Our friends at Nissan have the lineup of SUVs with the capabilities to take your adventure to the next level. Introducing the 2024 Nissan Rogue. It's perfect for city drives and for great escapes. Class exclusive Google is built in as you're always updating assistant to call on for almost anything. Gone are the days of connecting your phone. You now have Google Assistant. Google Maps and Google Play Store built right into the 12.3 inch HD touchscreen infotainment system in the vehicle. The 2024 Rogue is the perfect midsize crossover for your next adventure. But what about the 2024 Nissan Pathfinder? It has room for up to eight, an expansive cargo capacity, and advanced available 4x4 capability with 284 horsepower and up to 6,000 pounds of towing. When adventure calls, the Pathfinder is there to answer. Take the Nissan Rogue, Nissan Pathfinder, or Nissan Armada and go find your next big adventure. Shop NissanUSA.com. Man, I came into tonight with the lowest of expectations for the Sacramento Kings. Whether you heard me talk about it on Locked On Kings over the past couple of days, or you heard me talk about it on uh, D'Lo and KC, uh, ESPN 1320 Radio this afternoon, I've talked a lot about how I think recently this Kings offense has been fundamentally flawed. And on paper, the way to defeat the Sacramento Kings, the blueprint for defeating the Sacramento Kings has been made crystal clear to every single team in the league, and it has to do with muddying the paint, make life, make life difficult for Sacramento to score around the rim, and to dare them to beat you from the perimeter, right? The Kings shot 58 threes in their loss to the Oklahoma City Thunder, their blown 20-point lead loss to the Thunder. The Kings only scored 26 points in the paint in their loss to the Oklahoma City Thunder. Well, tonight, the Kings shot 16 of 38, which is 42% from three-point range. I will take that any given night. And they had 54 points in the paint, went 27 of 41. The Kings averaged 51 points in the paint this season. But over the four-game road trip they just came back from, they only scored 37 points in the paint per game. That's how much they were struggling to score around the rim. Tonight, that wasn't the issue. And the Kings made it a point of emphasis tonight to get downhill, to get to the paint, to get to the rim, but not just spray for open threes. I understand that is a fundamental part of Mike Brown's offense, right? That is a pillar of his offense, and he wants his team to try and generate those as much as possible. I understand what that, and to some extent, agree with that. However, there is such a thing as doing it too much and not looking to score at the rim. That was not an issue for the Kings tonight. It was Harrison Barnes attacking, De'Aaron Fox attacking, DeMontis Sabonis finally getting a little bit of rhythm. I think he had 18 points uh, tonight for Sacramento. Uh, let me see. Let me confirm. Yeah, 18 points tonight. Like There are so many different aspects of this game offensively that addressed my concerns. And yet, you scored 123 points. That 120-point number is typically the magic number for the Sacramento Kings. And then they gave up 135. It's always something, right? Your defense has been so damn good for the last couple of months, really, since the All-Star break, but especially through the month of March and early April. Defensively, man, you've been playing so freaking well. If only the offense were playing at the level that we know you're capable of, even without Malik Monk and Kevin Herter. The Kings showed it tonight on offense. And their defense was 
the struggle bus again, right? Kings have that great offensive night. They're killed by the three-point shot like they had been so much during the early part of this season. The New Orleans Pelicans, 22 of 40, 55% from three-point range tonight. That includes Trey Murphy going 6 of 12 from three. C.J. McCollum, who loves to play the Sacramento Kings and has probably still a chip on his shoulder from the Kings not drafting him. He goes 9 of 12 from three-point range. And then you have Jose Alvarado, too, who went 4 of 6 from three-point range. And Mike Brown said post-game, a couple of Jose's uh, made threes in the second half were back-breaking threes, and I completely agree with him, right? You finally get that offensive performance that I'm looking from. You did uh, or looking for. You did enough offensively to win this game. But the defense that I said I thought was more reliable than the offense at this point, of course, that wasn't anywhere to be found. On top of that, hey, it gets worse. The Kings, so good about getting out in transition. The Pelicans beat the Kings in transition 28-22 to tonight. If you were to tell me the Kings had 22 points in transition, I would have told you, told you there's a very, very, very good chance they're winning that game. Of course, tonight, it wasn't good enough because they allowed the Pelicans to get out in transition. And on top of that, too, the Kings struggled to take care of the basketball. 14 turnovers leading to 18 Pelican points. I know the context of this has changed, and this is kind of old news compared to, like, we have the context of tonight's game now, and this question and these comments have everything to do with the Oklahoma City game. But before the game started in Mike Brown's pregame press conference, I got the opportunity to to ask Mike and, and, and challenge Mike and talk to Mike a little bit about the over-reliance on the three and the lack of paint scoring and, and, and touch like that. You'll, uh, you'll hear my question that I ask of him. And Mike gave me a three-and-a-half-minute well-thought-out response where he takes some uh, it takes on some responsibility for some of the things that he said post game after the Oklahoma City Thunder game in some ways he doubles down on the the, sh- the being okay with the amount of threes and the shot selection right i i play this for two reasons number 1 is i think this is mike addressing a lot of the concerns that myself and many of you kings fans had with the kings offense and that Oklahoma City Thunder game in general Number two, I'm playing this because this speaks to the type of head coach that Mike Brown is, the type of man that Mike Brown is. Because there are a lot of head coaches in this league that a media member, especially someone who has no professional basketball experience whatsoever, to question your game plan and to, 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 to challenge you, a lot of coaches will shut that down or not even humor it or even give you a jab back, like put you in your place, like shut up, you don't know what you're talking about. That's not who Mike is. Mike wants to explain, he's open to hearing criticisms, and he wants to teach. And I thought this soundbite from Mike, again, it's not the context of tonight's game necessarily, but this soundbite from Mike I thought was uh, was important for Kings fans to listen to. Mike, building off of a lot of what you just said there about attacking the rim and getting in the paint, I think you averaged 51 points per game in the paint this season, but it was only 37 during the, the road trip, 26 in Oklahoma City. I understand the emphasis on wanting to spray threes, but when the defense is daring you to shoot the three like they are, is there something or adjustment that you're looking for to try and open up the paint and score on the inside a little bit more than the 26 that you got in OKC? No, 100%. You know, it, um, and, and again, when I'm, when I'm talk sprays, I'm, I love spray threes. And, and I told our team today um, I, after the game that there was one play during the Oklahoma City game and I addressed this with our team after the game, but HB was wide open on the right wing across from their bench, and he drove it in the traffic, and we got a worse shot. I'm a firm believer if you're open in this business, especially if you shoot 38%, if you miss three, screw it, shoot it again, and I'll live with it because the basketball guys are going to make you pay, and they made us pay on that possession. And, it, you know, I'm a big-time believer in that, and it just stuck with me, and it stuck with me too much to the point that after the game, I told our team, I said, in the second half, I thought our sprays went down, and, and, I, and I thought we passed up threes, and then when I went back and watched it, I was like, holy, sh- I was wrong. And I told our team, I said, hey, guy, I told our team today, I said, hey, guys, I was wrong. You guys, you guys shot more than enough threes. Uh, you took open threes. I said I let that one play stick with me. And, you know, obviously being emotional after a game like that, sometimes the best thing is to shut the hell up, and I didn't. Um, but, but I, and, and, and our guys sprayed the ball. 
we had 32 sprays. And, and again, when I say spray it, that doesn't always mean spray to shoot the three. Spray to shoot it. If you're open, that's the first thing. Spray to swing it. Spray to snap drive it. And sometimes you might get multiple paint touch and, and even roll on, on rolls, you're catching it. We had two beautiful rolls where we had a Canada cut. One time Domas did it. One time Alex did it. And the defense collapsed and they just kicked it right to the strong core. And one time to Keon for a wide open three. And I can't remember who the other guy was. But we played a beautiful game of basketball offensively. We just couldn't make wide open shots. And I hate to say it, people may disagree with me on this, but if, if you're open like we were in that game, you got to do it. During the game, you might remember this, Davion drove it one time against Chet, and he got it blocked. And, and I, I told Davion, I said, hey, spray it, spray it. You know, I'm not, not mad or nothing. I just think spray it because you got Chet on you. Well, when I looked at the film, I'm like, nobody. Nobody was open. Everybody stayed hugged up and everybody was home. Now, he could have did what I call Nash it, keep his dribble and keep the ball moving because there was 13 seconds on the shot clock. But when you have a guy like Chet in there and you play the way they play, it, it, you got to take what the defense gives you, in my opinion. And it ended up being 58 threes. Uh, I, I, I felt that they were all good. Keegan might have taken one tough one. Uh, Keon took a couple of tough ones. I told – and. I, this is, I told Foxy, hey, Foxy, you got to force the issue at the end of the game. You got to look to, you know, I th thought Foxy let him off the hook a couple of times at the end of the game. But other than that, Matty, I mean, I, I'm telling you, hey, if, the, if they're going to give us that, we got to step in and we got to make shots. And we can't be wide open and just say, I'm going to put my head down and drive into the defense just because we took 53s. And, and I have to keep giving them confidence by telling them, let it fly, let it fly, let it fly. And, and hopefully if we do and we play the right way like we did for the most part in the Oklahoma City game, it equates to, to more made threes. Now they got to come out and close out. Now maybe it's easier to finish at the rim, you know. Like I said at the top of the show, today's episode of the Locked On Kings podcast is brought to you by FanDuel. It is playoff time in the NBA and the NHL. Baseball's in full swing, and FanDuel is your place to bet on every single game. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed. That's 150 bucks, win or lose. Bet on anything from slap shots to home runs to slam dunks all on an app that is safe, secure, and easy to use. And you can bet on so many different things, right? You can bet right now on, on which place the Sacramento Kings will end up at. 8th, ninth, or 10th. Of course, when it comes to the play-in round, no matter who the Kings play, you can bet on that game, plus, plus fun side bets and prop bets and things like that around different NBA games, all playoffs long. It's just one of the many ways you can enjoy sports gambling on FanDuel. What are you waiting for? Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and make your first bet an automatic win. FanDuel, America's number one sports book. So here you go. It all comes down to this. Put up or shut up, right? You got two games remaining. Neither of those two games are against the Golden State Warriors or Los Angeles Lakers, who you are tied with in the standings. You got the, uh, the, the Phoenix Suns, who, yes, that game is important from the prospect of trying to leapfrog the Suns and, and, and maybe steal seventh away from them, right? So it's important in that sense. But to me, again, it's even more important in winning that game to create as much separation as you possibly can from the Warriors and the Lakers who are right behind you. That Portland Trailblazers game, I think we all have in like in our minds, we've used a permanent marker and we've already written a W next to it. Maybe we're stupid for feeling that way, but I think the Kings should be looking at that as well. They have to, have to, have to, have to, no ifs, ands, or buts about it, win that game. If they find a way to beat the, uh, the Phoenix Suns tomorrow and then lose that game to the Portland Trailblazers, you talk about a meltdown in Sacramento. Boy, I, I do not envy anybody who has to listen to that episode of the Lockdown Kings podcast because I, I don't know what I'll do at that point here in the Golden 1 Center. But we got to get there first, right? And you get there by beating the Phoenix Suns. The good news is the Kings do have the tiebreaker over the Lakers and the Warriors. They have it over the Lakers because head-to-head -head matchups, the Kings swept the Lakers this year. Over the Warriors, the Kings are 2-2. Two and two. However, the tiebreaker becomes your divisional record, right? And because the Warriors and Lakers and Kings are all in the same division, the Kings have a better divisional record than the Warriors do. So the Kings own the Warriors tiebreaker. So the Warriors and Lakers both have to pass Sacramento 
They do that by winning the remainder of their games while Sacramento loses one of them. Basically, if the Kings win out, they're guaranteed eighth, right? They have to win out and they secure eighth. So they control their destiny. But if they lose, they then have to rely on other teams. Here's how the rest of the schedule looks for both these teams, right? The Warriors play the New Orleans Pelicans tomorrow. So, hey, Pelicans, you, you beat us tonight fair and square. Hey, do us a favor. Knock the Warriors off tomorrow as well because the Pelicans are still playing to try and hold the Suns off and secure uh, that, that sixth seed and make it into the playoffs outright. So they have a lot to the play for, just like the Phoenix Suns have a whole hell of a lot to play for in tomorrow night's game. So it's not going to be a walk in the park by any means for Sacramento, not that we were expecting it to be. After that, the Warriors have the Jazz. We all expect the Warriors to win that game, right? So the Kings need help from the Pelicans tomorrow, and not just in that game, the Pelicans also play the Los Angeles Lakers in the Lakers' final game of the season. So the Pelicans can be the best friend of the Sacramento Kings by beating both of those teams for Sacramento. That still doesn't guarantee that the Kings are in if both of those teams lose those games to the Pelicans. Now, if the Warriors lose both games to the Pelicans or Jazz, or the Lakers lose both games to the Grizzlies and then Pelicans, then they can't catch Sacramento because of the tiebreaker situations, right? Even if the Kings go 0-2. But again, it's all about just go 2-0. Don't even worry about what the Pelicans are doing, the Lakers are doing, the Warriors are doing. Go 2-0. It's time to just excuses be damned, the context of the regular season be damned, you've blown leads against the Suns, you've beaten the Suns, you're playing them for the fifth time. None of it matters. Just win these two games. Doesn't matter if you're injured. Doesn't matter who you have and who you don't have. Doesn't doesn't matter who's playing well and who's not playing well. Just win. You're on your home floor. Very easy to say, of course, harder to do. But that's the point that you're at. You are essentially in the playoffs before the playoffs have even started. You're playing for the best chance to make it into the playoffs via the play-in right now. Go out and get the job done, right? Because it's very likely that If you beat the Phoenix Suns tomorrow, you'll be facing the Phoenix Suns again in the play-in tournament. And if you handle your business and you get a little luck on the the Suns side as well, because the Suns play both the Kings and then the Timberwolves, so two really good teams. Well, we think the Kings are really good. The Timberwolves, are we know, are really good after that, although the Timberwolves might shut everybody down depending upon how secure they are in their position. Right, The, The Kings have a chance to host the Suns again if they I mean obviously best case scenario you get to seven you play the Suns in the first round even if you lose that game you have a crack at the winner between the Warriors and the Lakers on your home floor I know that's terrifying in its own right but that's certainly a better scenario than the Kings dropping to nine or ten and having to face either the Warriors or the Lakers just for a chance to face the loser of the seven or eight game to just get the eighth seed and then probably get swept or lose in five games in the opening round right It's not an ideal position to be in. Simplify it. Two games, both at home. You win them both, and you with bare minimum secure eighth and avoid disaster. That's it. As straightforward as I can make it. Win two games, avoid disaster. That's where this season is at. So how are you feeling about these Kings chances right now? Let me know. Hit me up on Twitter, at MattGeorgeSack. Email me, MattGeorgeSports at gmail.com. You want to share your predictions on how tomorrow night's game against the Suns are going to go. If you want to uh, share your prediction of how you or where you think the Kings are going to finish, send it all to me. I'd love to hear from from you. Of course, if you're coming to the Kings-Suns game tomorrow, come by the top of Section 105. That's where I sit in the media area. Come by, say hi, hit me up, and let let me know that you're coming. I'd love to uh, organize, meet you in person. Regardless of what happens, you know I appreciate your support. Even if you disagree with me or think I'm being overdramatic, I really appreciate your support. Can't wait to have you join me on tomorrow night's episode of Locked on Kings. God, I hope it's a positive, happy episode. But no matter what, I'll be here for you. Until then, my name is Matt George. You've been listening to the Locked on Kings podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network.